uh, get started. Okay, welcome. For those of you who are joining the room who've been waiting for us to open this uh, webinar, a warm welcome to um, all of you joining from all over the world for the uh, Immunization Monitoring Academy's uh, webinar today on the topic of denominators. I'm Ayla Satki. I'm joined by uh, uh, Jan Grevendonk, who has uh, invited, who has two guests today <laughs> uh, for this uh, webinar. So Mamadou Diallo from UNICEF and Marta Gassik Dobo from uh, WHO. So uh, before we get started with the panel, um, I want to um, uh, point your attention if this is especially if this is your first webinar if it's your second or third you already know how to do this and I see we have a, a Pakistani colleague who has gone to the website menti.com and used the code 945913 so and if you do that then you'll see a slot in which you can type the name of the country that you're connecting from and right now four people have uh, figured out how to do that. So go to menti.com and type the code 945913. And then you will then see, yes, okay, 10 of you have figured out how to do it. So, um, you know, go to the website. So the suggested, if you're on your desktop computer, yes, uh, pull out your phone and go to your phone's web browser. You don't need a special app for Mentimeter, for menti.com. Just go to menti.com and then use the code 945913. And as soon as you've done that, you'll be able to type in, okay, someone has put in a smiley uh, as their country of uh, origin, as well as, uh, I guess that's a flag. All right, so we have right now the, uh, uh, largest contingents uh, in the webinar are from India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and then we also have significant numbers of participants from, uh, so it's moved, changing very quickly as more of you are figuring out how to do this. So you do not need, you are free to introduce yourselves in the chat, but to make your voice heard, we're using Mentimeter today. So it, if uh, this is the first time you're using this, um, the suggested approach is to grab your phone. Now, if you're already connecting to Zoom on your phone, that's okay. Just uh, go to your web browser. You should still be able to hear me and the panelists uh, uh, just fine. And then uh, on your web browser, on your, uh, on your phone, um, type www.menti.com and then you'll see a screen that asks you to enter a code and that's where you enter the code 945913. So 69 of you right now have, uh, have figured out how to uh, how to uh, how to indicate, let us know. And so throughout this webinar, we'll be using Mentimeter. Uh, Jan Grevendonk has prepared several sort of key points where, where he'll be asking you to you know, uh, share your views, um, vote on specific items, but even beyond that, to share your experience. So this is one of the two tools through which uh, that we'll be using today to make this, um, this, uh, this webinar interactive. So the, um, the other tool is actually built into Zoom and it is the Q&A panel. So you should see a Q&A button uh, in your Zoom application, whether you're on the desktop or the phone. If you click on that button, you will see a feature whereby you can ask questions. So please do not get the two confused. Uh, Mentimeter is relevant only when you see a prompt, such as here you see what country are you connecting from you see the Mentimeter logo and the prompt is to go to menti.com and use the code 945913. The Q&A tool you'll be able to use throughout and that you will use to ask your questions as well as in some cases where you're prompted to share your experience. Um, so, and then the key part of the uh, Q&A tool will be to vote on the item. So right now we have uh, around almost a hundred, maybe we'll move to the next slide. So we still have the largest contingents from Nigeria now, India, Pakistan, Ghana. Um, and let's see, and then we have many, many other countries uh, represented. Now, uh, the ground rules, this event is participatory. So we welcome and encourage uh, you to chat uh, during the entire uh, session. 
you know, you are free to share your, your, your views, but if you want to make your questions count, use the Q&A button in Zoom. Uh, we will not be taking questions from the chat, from the chat window. And second, the other way to make your voice count is when you see a Mentimeter um, you know, some poll or question, then go to menti.com and use the code 945913. Now, we may also, if time allows, uh, call on specific participants. So to indicate that you'd like to speak, use the raise hand uh, menu item. And a key message is really, you know, we are many, we're already over 200 participants today. Um, 955 people registered for this, to participate in this webinar. So if we're not able to answer your question today, you know, uh, please understand, we ask for your indulgence uh, and our commitment. There'll be, please do, you do not need to ask if the recording or the resources for this webinar will be available. That's a commitment made by WHO and the Immunization Monitoring Academy to really share all of those resources with everyone who participates. So that's, um, that's it for the ground rules. And thank you for successfully participating in uh, the first Mentimeter poll. And there will be many other occasions through which you can, uh, you can interact in this webinar. Click on the Q&A button if you have any early questions. Today, the topic is denominators. And this is where I will leave it to Jan Grevendonk to introduce the topic and his guests for today's panel. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Reda. Um, so my name is Jan Grevendonk. I work in the World Health Organization in Geneva uh, in the immunization department around data. So today we have uh, two special guests and they're also very motivated guests because they're both in New York and they got up uh, very, very early to be able to be with you and present um, on denominators. So I'll first ask uh, Mamadou from uh, UNICEF to introduce himself. Hi, good morning, everyone. So my name is Mamadou Diallo, as I said, and I work here at UNICEF. Uh, I'm a statistician here at headquarters of UNICEF, and um, I am working with the immunization team uh, onto immunization data. So welcome everybody and thank you for inviting me. And we also have uh, Marta who is actually my boss and who is also in New York at this time. Good morning everyone. I am Marta Gacis Dobo and I also work at immunization at Geneva headquarters um, on the strategic information group involved with immunization data and monitoring and very excited to be here and to see how eager you are to learn about denominators. So thank you very much. Um, we'll go through the presentation and we'll also like, as Reda indicates, indicated, we'll actually uh, take time to, to answer your questions as well. Um, first of all, what the objectives of these sessions are. Um, so first of all, we want to discuss a use of population estimates in immunization discuss some challenges with that and we know there's a lot of challenges uh, but then also try to provide concrete ideas to strengthen denominators for coverage monitoring and your targets for planning so concrete things that you can put in your data improvement plan if you identify that denominators are uh, a challenging area which we believe they are in most cases uh, so we don't promise you that we will solve all denominator issues but we will uh, try to um, come up with doable things, small doable things that you can actually do in your districts, in your countries to improve the situation. Uh, the agenda uh, will have, uh, as always, a little quiz to start with, to warm up. Um, we'll try to explain you why we even need population estimates, um, go over the challenges that we have with them, uh, and present to you first our IDs, which are five IDs to improve population, uh, to improve denominators and target setting. But then we also wanted to ask you to share your experiences. And for that, let me go to the next slide. For, sorry, for that, um, for your experiences, so I will tell you in a minute how to do that, but think about uh, areas where you kind of um, had to face a challenge with, challenge with denominator estimates, uh, population estimates, and how you went about solving that. Put that into the Q&A box and say, I would like to present on my experience with X and Y and Z and my challenges and what the benefit of that was. Now, everybody else, we would ask you to vote on those IDs by giving a thumbs up. 
but first, as we said, let's start with a quiz and some people have already started doing that. Uh, just to warm you up to, to start you thinking about the next questions. Do you agree or disagree with the following statements? Um, so first of all, that there are more denominator issues at the subnational level than at the national level. Uh, so to answer this, you need to go to menti.com and use the code 945913, so 945913. The first one is whether there are more issues at the subnational level than at the national level. Whether there are more issues in high coverage settings than in low coverage settings. Whether there are more issues in city than in rural areas. And whether denominator issues are more common than numerator issues. Uh, then maybe a provocative uh, two questions, whether you think there's nothing we can do about denominators and whether denominators should only include a country's citizens, so nationals of that country. And 33 people have already indicated whether they agree or not with that. Uh, let me actually maybe start going over that. There's no really uh, correct answers for most of these questions, but just to say that, yes, we think that there are more issues at subnational level than at the national level, and we actually will kind of go through the reasons of why that may be the case. Um, we have a slide that explains uh, the difference between high coverage and low coverage settings, so keep tuned for that. We will get the answer to that uh, then. Uh, more denominator issues in cities and in rural areas, I would say that is true because um, there is definitely more kind of uh, difficult to manage and track population in, in cities. Uh, on the other side, the flip side of that is that there's also kind of maybe people moving away from the countryside and that also has its own challenges in terms of denominators. Um, and most people seem to think that denominator issues are more common than numerator issues. So that, may, that might be true, but what we would like you to caution is that um, not everything can be explained by denominators. There's also uh, another part where you have to take responsibility for the doses you report and count. So the numerator issues are also important. Um, and we're happy to see that you don't think that there's nothing we can do about denominators because uh, if not, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, and also to say that we think that a denominator should not only include a country citizen, it should include everybody who lives in a country because diseases don't uh, discriminate between somebody who lives uh, in a country versus who is a citizen of that country. All right, thank you for uh, the opinions for that. With that, we're going to uh, start with um, some more of the contents. Uh, again, to re reiterate, if you have uh, any experience to share, please tell us. Tell us why it worked, why didn't it work, um, and put that experience in the Zoom Q&A. Try to describe it a little bit. And if enough people like you already, then we will actually call on you at towards the end of this uh, 90 minutes uh, to come and actually present it in plenary and then people can um, ask about that. So Jan, we'll, just to point out, we already have, uh, uh, we only have four questions submitted so far. Um, the, um, the top one has received five votes, uh, but they're quite, um, you know, uh, quite, quite specific and good questions. So, uh, but they may be- yes, can, we, by the presentation. can we hold on, on the questions? Because we just, keep, we just start with the uh, questions and then we will definitely come back to that to the extent that certainly that we don't answer them already. Um, but maybe Mamadou, can I ask you to kind of first kind of introduce like why do we even need population estimates? Thank you, Jan. Uh, so yeah, why do we need population estimate? Actually, the, the main reason why we want to estimate population is to ensure that all children are rich. So when we provide vaccination services, we know the children that we have vaccinated. We know the children that have dropped out, meaning that they started a series of uh, vaccines but maybe didn't finish the series. We also mainly know the, the children that have opt out or the people that have opt out in a way that maybe we have reached to these people, but they decided for some reason not to take the vaccination. But there are people that likely we have not reached. And if we don't have a good uh, denominator estimate, uh, population estimate, we may not know that there are out there uh, children that we have not reached. Also, one area where population estimate is very important is uh, in equity. Because in equity, you are interested in targeting specific populations, uh, uh, specific groups, 
and it's very important to have a good handle of the, that group to know how many uh, are out there in that group so that usually they are underserved or they are not rich at the level of the general population so that having a good estimate of that population will help reach them and close the gap with uh, the general population. Um, next. Um, so uh, how do we use the population estimate? So uh, we can see two big buckets. So one is on you calculating coverage estimate and another one around targeting populations. So for co uh, calculating coverage estimate, usually this happened from the district level, uh, aggregated all the way to the national level. So uh, usually this is done for monitoring purposes. And at the, when more we go to the, uh, to the local level, so at the district level, you have issues on, or you may run into issues where the population, where they live, and where they get services may be different. So when that overlap is not uh, very uh, high, you may get different coverage estimate uh, using population that get services to an area versus the population that are estimated to live in that area. However, when you aggregate to the national level, usually that's uh, discrepancy uh, even out and then uh, you should be able to get uh, good uh, coverage estimate, assuming that the methodology is uh, is uh, strong. And the targeted uh, at the local level, what we mean here by local level is usually sub-district. So there the idea of the population is really to target your group, to make sure that you reach all your group. So in the planning, if you have a good handle of your population, you may plan your services accordingly so that you make sure that you reach all the uh, population in these local areas. Yes, thank you. So then Mamadou described the uses and, and how we use uh, those population estimates. So now thinking about where we even get uh, population estimates from, what are the possible sources, right? Uh, so first of all, uh, there's a civil registration vital statistics. So very few people, very few countries, have a system that is good enough for that, that is really complete, that can track births and deaths uh, to an extent that we can really make sure that this provides a good basis for population estimates. And of course, that is a pretty ideal situation because then we can have very detailed uh, information on uh, how many people, uh, children, people in general live in a certain area. Um, but that being said, this is probably not the case for most of, of us, for you. Um, so we often depend on, on census data, which are periodic, and projections uh, between census data that kind of apply growth rates uh, on what census is found in the meantime. Uh, there's a third kind of bucket of uh, source for population estimates, and that's what we would call local data. So uh, everything that comes uh, bottom up, which can be um, local enumerations like headcounts. It can be service data, for example, uh, how many antenatal, uh, antenatal care visits there were or BCG or Penta vaccinations are often used. Um, it can also be uh, from a register or a registry. So a register basically meaning kind of a, um, a health register, such as an immunization register or a registry uh, referring to a system like an electronic immunization registry that tries to capture everybody into the registry and tries to uh, use that um, uh, that, that number of registered uh, patients or people as the denominator for the intervention. Um, so these are kind of the main buckets. Uh, going forward, I'm going to discuss only two of them, assuming that uh, civil registration and vital statistics are not a good option for you right now. Uh, what are the benefits and challenges of what remains? So the good thing about census data is that these are independent estimates, right? It's done by something, so, somebody outside of the health system. Um, uh, and, and it's also often organized by a uh, National Bureau of Statistics or similar that have uh, potentially more advanced demographic uh, experts uh, helping with that uh, exercise. Um, but on the negative side for censuses is that they can, they can sometimes be politically motivated, as you know. Um, they're actually often used for very many different things, not just for health. So 
the political implication is often so important that it really skews uh, the findings from the census. Um, they tend to be less accurate at the lower level, even because of the methodology. Um, and furthermore, the accuracy of projections uh, in between censuses decreases over time. So censuses is kind of a snapshot. What happens in between really is kind of a prediction and we don't have much information to kind of um, update necessarily the census estimates in between these two uh, events that you take that snapshot. So on the other hand, you have local data that, um, for example, relies on nurses taking headcounts or door-to-door -door visits. And the good thing about that is that it's more timely. It can be frequently updated. Um, it obviously also leads to more local buy-in and empowerment because then really people can trust in their denominators. Often when you have the two system, they talk about the true denominator versus the, the official one, et cetera. Um, but there might be a risk of bias. So first of all, against temporary populations or people with less access to the health system. So the same people that uh, Mamadou mentioned before, the ones that you never find out about, that don't really have access to the health system, you have a risk of not finding them when you do your local headcount either. Um, nurses, for example, might also be hesitant to register uh, guest workers or um, seasonal workers, for example. Uh, because they say, well, these people will move on, so I should make them part of my headcount because then I will be held accountable for vaccinating them and I can't really do that. So there might be a bias in that. And then finally, there might be uh, the risk of gaps and overlaps between catchment areas, meaning that um, the way uh, the system is um, set up, uh, it's, not always, it's not always sure that there's not kind of um, uh, gaps between the geographical areas of one health facility or one district versus the other health district or health facility. So especially if there's informal settlements, there might be the tendency that nobody really has taken that into account as being, um, as being their uh, responsibility. Uh, so what we would say is that the census data we see as kind of the prime, um, the prime source to use as denominators for coverage monitoring at the national, subnational and district level, as Mamadou said before while the local data can mostly be used for target setting at the local and, and even at the district setting at sometimes. And there's definitely an opportunity then to triangulate those data. So to the extent that that data is being reported up, it should be used to compare it uh, between the census projections and those enumerations. Um, with that being said, and, and with that kind of explanation, so we want to take a quick quiz and ask you what, what describes your situation best do you work in a country where you would say there's no flexibility with denominators? There are only official denominators and they're kind of uh, imposed top down and they're obviously going to be often uh, census driven. Uh, or is there a mixed situation where you have official denominators which are uh, sent to you top down, but there is some flexibility around using targets at the local data level, at the local level? Or at the other end of the spectrum, I know this is the case, for example, in countries like Myanmar, but also a lot of the ex-Soviet um, uh, countries, um, where people use local enumeration data as the only and, and principal source of uh, denominators. So local enumerations are being reported uh, bottom-up and become the basis for coverage estimation and everything else. And as you vote, um, I understand that that's actually quite interesting. So there's a number of... Um, so the largest groups have either no flexibility uh, and it's top down, or there's kind of a mixed hybrid situation where you have some flexibility, at least for target setting at the local level. And that is actually the biggest group. Um, so that actually allows for, for interventions. This actually gives us some flexibility then also to make, um, to make recommendations on what you can do with that flexibility. There's also relatively few people that say, yes, we, we use uh, local data enumeration uh, bottom-up reported as the main source for uh, coverage. Right, so we have a bit of all, but it's good to see that uh, the, the, the top-down with flexibility uh, uh, kind of system is, is the most uh, frequently uh, reported. So Mamadou will then talk about uh, some of the issues we see. Yeah, so um, this slide talk a little bit about the source, sources of population estimate at the national level. And uh, so the main source, as Jan mentioned earlier, is the, uh, the census data at the national level. So 
it's advice uh, to run a census about every 10 years. So every 10 years or so countries run a census and have detailed information on populations um, uh, for the country. So that's the baseline. And now between two censuses, when the, as the census get, get old, you can uh, expect that the information is uh, more, less accurate. And therefore, every year projections are done by the statistical, gross statistical offices to update, if you wish, the information based on, on knowledge of population growth and birth rates and uh, mortality rate and so on. Uh, so those projections are used every, pro, done every year can be used for denominator. Um, one drawback with the projections is that usually they are not done at the local level. So they are done at the national level, at the regional level, but um, even at the district levels, uh, you usually don't see, or oh, it's not all country do it at the district level and definitely not at the sub-district sub, sub level. Um, there are also other sources of uh, estimates that are uh, that are used by programs. So, for example, the Minister of Health, uh, usually the health information systems, they can come up with their own adjusted uh, population estimate based on health information they have. Um, other sources also can be based on the service delivery. So. Uh, department within the government for the specific need may have uh, other sources of target, uh, target the populations. Uh, and lastly, proxy information also is used to estimate uh, populations. For example, the vaccines that are used to our birth uh, can be used as a proxy to know the target population for, uh, for children under one. So for example, BCG, Admissive dose can be used as an estimate of uh, populations. And as you see, originating from the census, there are many ways of deriving uh, estimate of population using projections, other uh, service based uh, data, and so on. So those may lead to conflicting information that there is an illustration in the next slide. Um, so <clears throat> So here you can see an example of uh, many sources that different sources that are, ha, have been used to get an idea of what the population is. And you can see that the, uh, the dots here are the UN uh, population division estimate of birth that uh, is decreasing over time according to the uh, uh, estimates. But if you look at the VCG administered dose, that estimate is increasing uh, over time. And uh, uh, the target populations are uh, given. The blue line is increasing to some degree and then uh, start decreasing. And if you were to use, for example, the birth here as a population estimate and calculate coverage, for example, for, uh, for BCG, you may get uh, coverage that are uh, over 100%. So these give, show you a little bit the challenges that uh, there are many sources which can be a benefit because we can triangulate information and have more uh, insight on what's going on. But at the same time, it's a challenge because now we need to reconcile all this and try to understand what's going on to be able to come up with uh, a decent population estimate. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Jan. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll show kind of a few more slides with also like a few more illustrations of the, the difficulties we have with uh, denominators. Um, and the first one that I want to illustrate is the mismatch that might exist between uh, the catchment area and the place of vaccination. So just remember that if we say we want to monitor coverage, what we actually do is we have a population estimate for a catchment area. And then we compare that to service data, like the numerator, the, the number of immunizations that are given in a certain place. Now, uh, in a few places, like uh, in this case, in the Bogota vaccination registry in uh, Colombia, uh, and you can do that if you have like a, a registry, an electronic registry, like for example, they also have in Bahrain, uh, Australia and the United States, uh, Scandinavian countries, but unfortunately not in many other places. But if you have that, you can actually try to keep track of the, the place where people live versus where they're immunized. 
And what this slide, which is a bit difficult to, to look at, but I'm going to show it anyway, but what it shows you is that uh, there's actually not that much uh, overlap between the place where people live and where they're vaccinated. Um, what it means is that from any catchment area, there's a number of people who go somewhere else. And in any service area, there's a number of people who come from, so, from somewhere else to get their vaccination. So if you kind of follow one of these lines here, and I think it's really too small to look at it now, but you can look at it later, maybe when you have downloaded the presentation, is that you can see that uh, one area such as Suba um, might have, uh, I can't even read the numbers, but they might have like 10,000 uh, children in that uh, area, which are registered in the register as living in that area. But you can see that they're actually vaccinated all over uh, the rest of Bogota. And then there's only a subset of them, actually uh, a little bit more than half, that are vaccinated in Suba itself. But on the other hand, Suba will also kind of vaccinate a lot of people from other places in Bogota. So there's almost no uh, match between the numerator and denominator. So basically what we try to do when we use this kind of denominator, numerator kind of uh, for coverage monitoring at too low a level, we are risk of too much movement uh, obscuring the, the facts here. And actually, this is not useful anymore uh, for, for really kind of coverage monitoring at the lowest level. And this is an illustration of what uh, Mamadou said before. So for target setting, you might need to look at uh, different ways of, of organizing that. Uh, the other uh, slide that's maybe also a bit difficult to, to look at, but we still show it anyway is uh, an illustration of the fact that as coverage rises, that, that estimates become increasingly, increasingly sensitive to denominator errors. And just to make that um, easy, there's an example here that is shown. And let's say that you have uh, a district, let's say, uh, that has 100 children, and that doesn't change over time. So only 100 children. Now, as that district has, for example, 50% uh, coverage, right? Um, so you know that because the district vaccinates 50 children every month, every year, um, you could say, well, the, the coverage should be 50%. Now, what we can look at is kind of what uh, uncertainties around the denominator, how much impact that makes on the coverage. And let's say that we say that we can't really be sure if it's uh, 100 exactly, but it's between 90 and 110. So depending on if it's 90 or 110, immunizing 50 children, will lead to a coverage estimate of um, between 45 and 56%, which is actually a, a, a fairly kind of small interval. So it doesn't really matter that your uh, coverage estimate is not that uh, sure or uncertain, because basically the takeaway is still going to be that um, your coverage is still going to be quite close to the 50%, which is the true value, let's say. But on the other hand, as you kind of move to 90% and even more than that, what you see is that the, the, the implication of having the same uncertainty in, in denominator estimates really has a huge difference. Because if you, in, if you know you vaccinate 90 children, it makes of course a very big difference whether you have 90 children or 110 children or 100, because your coverage estimates will be between 80 and 100. So, um, this is actually a little bit of a contradiction, like as uh, health systems mature and immunization programs mature and you uh, vaccinate more and more children, the administrative coverage uh, method really becomes quite difficult uh, to get it right and really depends on really high quality uh, and really accurate uh, denominators, just to illustrate that point. And there's, uh, if you want to find out more, there's uh, a paper that's in your Dropbox in the resource folder uh, that describes it in much more detail by David Brown. Um, before we go into the solutions that we wanted to kind of start brainstorming about, uh, just to ask you, like looking at all these issues that we have seen, what do you think are the main consequences of having inappropriate targets? So wrong or inaccurate targets? Um, is it that unrealistically high targets may lead to over-reporting? Is it that too low targets lead to complacency? Is it that they lead to vaccine misallocation? Or is it that uh, coverage data, they become unusable for monitoring and prioritization? So here again, we ask you to go to menti.com and kind of uh, allocate 100 points to all of these uh, factors to try to indicate to us what you think are the, the most severe consequences of having inappropriate targets. And I'm also going to answer one question that I saw, that I saw in the Q&A that uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud asked. 
Uh, yes, vaccine measle, vaccine, vaccines are often also distributed based on the target population. So if you get the target wrong, uh, then your vaccine uh, allocation uh, becomes, a, becomes all uh, messed up. So in that case, I would actually suggest that you don't only look at the vaccine at the targets, but also at the actual consumption and triangulate that data of vaccine consumption versus uh, denominators and targets. Um, yes, as you started voting, so a lot of you think that um, unrealistically high targets lead to overreporting, and I think that's true. I think this is really one of the main problems we have in immunization, that if you impose a top-down target that seems totally unrealistic, uh, often people at the lower level will say, well, I know that I immunize everybody or at least 90%, um, but if I calculate the coverage this way, it will only tell me that I have 60%. So I'm going to over-report to make sure that I report the coverage correctly um, and, and not the numerator. Uh, so this is something that we see quite often. Um, coverage data become unusable for monitoring and prioritization. Yes, it's of course very frustrating to have all these uh, districts over 100% because you, don't, you can't really know where the, the real issues are. And that is of course a problem, especially at a higher level. Um, they lead to vaccine misallocation, as I have discussed. Um, but also, I think that it's an issue with uh, complacency. So if you give a very low target that can be easily met, um, then it leads to com then it might lead might lead to that health worker not going out in the community, find uh, populations at risk, uh, unimmunized children, etc., because they think they hit the target anyway. They have already more than 100%. So I think all of these are actually important uh, issues. I think that um, the complacency is actually probably for me uh, a very important one as well as the over-reporting. Uh, the vaccine misallocation, you can have like different ways of managing that and uh, coverage data become unusable for monitoring and prioritization. That is an issue, um, but you can also kind of uh, refer to, for example, uh, coverage service to actually um, um, to find out more about that. But thank you for thinking about that and, and prioritizing what is, in your point of view, the most important consequence. With that being said, we're going to go into some of what we want to propose to you as a few good ideas for, um, uh, uh, for, for kind of dealing with denominator issues. And at the same time as we're doing that, I would also again want to kind of uh, encourage you to put your uh, proposals for um, presentation into the Q&A and then we will kind of call on a few of you to present to the group what you have done in the past um, with that. So Mamadou, do you want to take uh, the first ID? Or do you want me to do it? Yeah, so um, yeah, let me um, do this and then uh, you can add and we can keep going. Uh, so yeah, so the first uh, element here is to make sure that you collaborate with uh, the statistical office and the other entities that are doing population estimate. Uh, as you know, population estimate is a very touchy, a very political uh, problem. And at the national level, the statistical office usually is the entity that is responsible for doing uh, population estimates. So sometimes the difficulties come from the miscommunications. So if we, we have a working group that include the statistical office, the um, health information systems, and the other players that do population estimate in the country. That's give us more better chance to have this estimate accepted and used by uh, at, the, in the, at the country level. And here we propose a couple of steps uh, to look at when you do population estimate to make sure that all, at least you cover the basics. And uh, many of these are done uh, systematically by the statistical office when they do their population estimate. So if you have population estimate, uh, make sure that you compare with the projections uh, that exist in the country from the statistical office and from international or other agencies that do population estimate. For example, the UN Population Division does projections. Uh, you also have your Census Bureau that does projections and um, they may have other entities as well. So try to compare and see whether there are discrepancies and try to address them, see if there's any, uh, um, any explanation that you can uh, come up for those discrepancies. 
<clears throat> make sure that you have uh, proper demographic methods. So this is uh, also come back to the collaborations because uh, that may not be our job at the uh, EPI to do this uh, sophisticated demographic method. So collaborating with statistical office and specialists in these domains can help us make sure that we are using this uh, at the, uh, the methodologies properly. And this tied to number three as well, where you need to calculate the growth uh, rates properly and make sure that they are plausible. And you need to choose the appropriate growth uh, populations. Um, the right target group, uh, for example, for children rather than the population as a whole. So those tie again to this collaboration that we uh, uh, are emphasizing here. Uh, so mortality rate uh, and infant calculations. So the idea here is that you get the information correctly. And at the subnational level, uh, the projections usually are not done by the uh, statistical office. So there you, may, you wanna make sure that uh, you review the program data correctly that are you using as an input here to inform your model. So you get the idea here that's collaboration and working with people who are familiar with the uh, demographic methods are, uh, is key here. Uh, Jan, next, unless you yes. wanna add something. Well, just, there you go. So this is an example where you need to use the good information to do a population estimate. For example, here, you can see that if you, the green bars here are the birth, and you can see that the last year, there's a big jump here. So you need to make sure to explain what is the jump here. And because you have this denominator jump here, the coverage you can see dropped very, uh, uh, deeply here from 84 to 66. So when you do a coverage calculation, you need to make sure that you look at your numerator, but also here uh, you are talking about denominator to make sure that your denominator makes sense. Uh, there is no jumps like this, or you can explain it and take uh, and, and document it properly if this is uh, explainable. Uh, next. Uh, so because you have a lot of source of information that, as we've seen in the previous slides, it's good to use a triangulation methodologies to try to understand what's going on uh, um, on the, at the district level and at the local level uh, across these different uh, source of uh, information. So make sure to explore the, uh, the adjustment that have been done to the denominator between censuses uh, to try to understand. One, for example, common issues is that the national rate, uh, growth rate or birth rate is applied everywhere. And the national rate may not be appropriate for some district because the way the population uh, change locally is different than the way uh, that happened at the national level. So taking into account trends uh, of the population uh, nationally, by region, et cetera, and see if there's any specific local knowledge that may explain situations. Maybe there are uh, uh, migrations happening or nomads, nomads that moving, uh, or there's an urbanization that happen in one part of the country that the growth is higher than what was projected from last census. So those kind of insight you need to, to triangulate to make sure that you uh, explain your situation or you understand better your situation. And there are other sources like the CRVS, which is the server registration headcounts and all these things that we can use at the local level to try to better understand uh, population estimate. Um, next one, um, Jan, do you wanna do the three? Uh, sure. So this is just to say that um, the district really have uh, a big role to play here. So we have talked about um, the consequences of having denominators that are not kind of representative uh, in terms of skewing the data. The reporting might lead, it might lead to over-reporting or it might lead to less effort once you hit the target. So it really 
comes down to, their, to the district to really uh, take the responsibilities to define good targets for their health facilities. As we said before, the, the, the denominators really only make sense uh, or as a coverage monitoring tool for districts, not really necessarily below the district. What you will typically have in a district is a number of health facilities. Each of one have different capacities. Uh, people might prefer one over the other. Uh, one might be close to the market or where people work, uh, etc. So it's really up to the district then to translate the denominators that they have into achievable targets for their health facilities and not uh, have these uh, targets either like too hard to reach, which will lead to over-reporting or uh, too easy to reach, which will lead to complacency. So the district, just to say, has a pivotal role. Uh, this is really very much linked to the micro planning uh, and supervision, et cetera. So it's really kind of, um, even if denominators might seem a little bit outside of the, of the scope of the district in terms of determining, determining the, the official estimates, there's really a big role in kind of translating uh, denominators into targets. Uh, make sure that the two are kind of al aligned to some level or uh, triangulate uh, appropriately where, where needed. Just again, to bring to your attention that we have a question that has, that has now uh, garnered uh, over 20, uh, uh, 20 votes. Um, so anytime yes, you'd like to. We have a few, but let's, let's first go to the five and then we'll take a number of questions and then we invite people to present what about that. Yeah, and, and here for uh, another idea to improve uh, the denominator is to use GIS information. Here really what's um, the idea here is to try to account for as many settlements as possible in our uh, planning. So we, the GIS will help us uh, have the more complete information and if you want, it's help us have up-to-date information uh, because in a way we can have real-time images and try to identify where these settlements are. Uh, now, it may not work in some situations where, for example, if you have dense forests, you may not identify all settlements properly. But this is a way that uh, we can use to identify settlement and make sure that all these settlements are rich and uh, children that are there are vaccinated. This can be done on paper. It's just the technology help facilitate things. Uh, what is important here is really the concept of mapping all the settlement and trying to reach uh, them and to update the, the map uh, uh, as often as possible for planning. Um, we can also use technology to do uh, a population estimate. Uh, so there are many, uh, innovative methodologies currently going on because as we said earlier we have censuses that go uh, 10 years apart and between the 10 years we have um, we have projections that may not go to the local level so one way one alternative that is emerging for estimating population between censuses is to use the satellite imageries where they try to detect uh, um, um, household or structures rather and then from a micro uh, census is on the ground they try to estimate population density and then come up with some estimation of the denominator um, they do it at a very um, very small uh, cells but then when you aggregate to a catchment area or to a district area this estimate may be very uh, may be stable. So these are innovative way that are being pursued to try to have uh, as better um, alternative uh, estimate of population that can be triangulated to uh, other uh, other known population estimates on the ground. Um, and last uh, point here is really the idea of this point is to. Uh, to be in contact with the community. So in because it's a local situation, there are many local situations going on. So being in contact with the community will help us to inform these situations and plan them in advance in our micro planning and our service delivery. So here we list some common situation, for example, urbanization and slums. So 
working with the community, uh, with the leaders and leaders in the community to try to have access to this community and plan session with the community will help uh, increase uh, the the service delivery in these uh, uh, areas. Migration and IDPs. Um, so because of conflict, we have population that move across countries sometimes, but internally within countries. So there are other institutions, uh, UN, for example, institutions and, uh, and NGOs and other groups that work with this, uh, these populations. So making connection with this group also will help uh, plan and understand the needs and uh, vaccinate uh, this population and make sure that the vaccination also is reported so that it's taken into account in the calculations of the coverage. Um, the seasonal workers and nomad uh, popula populations. So po there are countries where we have population that move uh, during the year for economic reasons or other reasons. And usually what we see is that these patterns are more or less known, but maybe not documented or taken into account in programs. So having a good knowledge of these uh, uh, patterns and how population move in the countries and where they go, why, that can help uh, know where the population are during the year and how to plan vaccinations accordingly. So, uh, so here the team, as you see, is more really the idea of reaching out to the community and trying to plan uh, uh, based on the needs of the community, so that this can be uh, more uh, of the children can be rich. Yeah, I think. All right, thank you very much. So uh, those were a few kind of quite concrete and good ideas, I think. Uh, but we also promised that we would like to hear from you. So Reda indicated me that his Zoom crashed and he can't see all the questions. So I'm going. I have kind of looked at the questions and I picked a few that are either questions or proposals for, to present something, uh, that, an experience, basically. Um, but let's start with a few questions. I think we have uh, the question with most um, votes was from Tiakrai Visa. I hope I pro pronounce that well, so we will definitely answer that question. Um, Dr. Khalid Abu Wakar uh, proposes, I think, uh, an intervention of something he did in his country. So we would like to hear from you in a minute, Dr. Abu Bakar. Um, Dr. Mohamed Imran Kureji has a question about bottlenecks in immunization and, and proper uh, denominator determination uh, that he would some more uh, clarification on. Um, Nicolas, Nicolas Valerde Gonzalez um, asks us about set denominators for the local level. I think to a certain extent we kind of um, we addressed that, but we'll try to come, come back to that. Um, Dr. Isa Mohamed Bello. Um, questions about how to estimate population in an insecure area. So I, I propose we kind of start with those and um, see how far we get and then take a few more. So first of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Tiakarai Visa. Uh, Reda, can we ask the person to, to ask the question live or should I read it? Uh, yes, let's do that. Uh, Tiakarai Visa is a WHO scholar accompanist and very pleased to see. So let me bring Jackery into the panel. Um, and we've already brought Dr. Halid Abu Bakr, so I would ask you to wait until, it'll take a few seconds until you're transferred over to the panel. And then if you have a webcam, it would be nice to see you as well if you're, if this is not mandatory by any means, but uh, it may take a few seconds. Okay, here we go. And Jackery, I'm going to unmute you. So the uh, floor is yours to share your, your, to explain, present and explain your question so the uh, panel may respond to it, please. Hello? Yes, Hello. We, we hear you, Jackery Jack Visa. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is about uh, just first, Countries can you briefly like, introduce yourself, Jackery? Tell us where you're connecting from, okay, what I'm, you do, and then ask your question. Okay. I'm Jackery Visa from Nigeria. I'm a field epidemiologist, <gasps> and uh, I'm a WHO scholar and an accompanist. Uh, my question is actually about 
a, a country like mine that uh, that have done census so many years ago. They will still uh, most times we use projected populations to for population to calculate our denominator to use as a denominator. So my major question is, um, what can be done? Is it is it is it right to actually use such kind of denominator? Because we're not, we're not actually sure if that uh, the projected population is uh, right or wrong. So is it right to use projected population as nature, or uh, there's a way to go about it? Hello. Yes, uh, let's hear from the statisticians. Uh, so Mamadou or Marta, do you want to respond to that question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, when the, so first of all, it will be good to, to, um, to try to get a new census, obviously. That's, that's the first thing, to try to advise for a new census. That will be the ideal situation. The other situation is really, it depends what we want to do. If we want to have an estimate at the national level, uh, there are other tools that have independent estimates of populations, like surveys, for example, that can give us a benchmark at the national level that we can compare with whatever projections we are doing currently at the national level, and to see, to your question, whether these numbers are off or not, because one of your question is you're not sure already whether these, these numbers are, are of or on it. So using surveys that are uh, accurate at national level or maybe regional level can give you a one independent check of on what's going on. The other, met other methodologies we, we show at the end was, for example, to use these innovative ideas of doing uh, satellite imageries and so on. For example, in Nigeria in the north, I know that polio have done some work around uh, that to try to estimate population estimate uh, using satellite imageries and they compared that to the projections uh, of the census, uh, the statistical office projections. So that's another way to have another independent source and try to triangulate. And the other source obviously is the program data. So to try to use the program data and triangulate with all the other information you get locally and then try to understand if there are discrepancies, what, what is the reason? And those are specific situations that uh, you need to look at your data in detail to try to come up with some kind of uh, uh, explanation or see where things make sense or doesn't make sense because locally there is population change here, for example, because of urbanization, migration, and so on and so forth, and try to look at it in more uh, um, local situations than national. So those are few ideas. Um, so thank you very much, Mamadou. Um, so Marta, chime in whenever you think it's appropriate. Uh, just to say that at, in the same time, I also opened the Q&A in the Mentimeter where you can actually ask questions specifically for this presenter follow-up question. And somebody also pointed out rightfully that in addition to the census being old in Nigeria, it's also quite political and therefore it provides quite uh, bad baseline data to start with in the first place. So you might need to look for uh, different ways of, of actually doing your target setting and, and uh, things like that. Um, should we go to Dr. Abu Bakar? Yes, so Dr. Abu Bakar, I'm now unmuting you. We can only see part of you. If there's a way for you to lower your webcam a little bit, there we go. Very nice to see you, doctor. And um, uh, let, uh, us here now from your um, submission, which was uh, to say the denominator is a major issue in our country. So please introduce yourself, remind us where you're from, and um, where you're talking about uh, falsified data focus and proxy indicators. Uh, let's le allow you to explain uh, the, uh, the issues you want to put on the table, please. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Dr. Uh, Khalid. Yeah. So you're uh, 
microphone does not seem to be working. I'm assuming you can hear us because you've been following along uh, and you are unmuted. So it's not coming from our side. You'll need to check your audio connection. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Jan, either you can, if you could, if you'd like to read his uh, submission or contribution or move to the next uh, presenter. And as soon as uh, you, if, if you can promptly fix your audio issues, then we may be able to come back to you, Dr. Khalid. Let's, let's do that. Let's first to do the next presenter and then we come back to Dr. Khalid because right now we can't hear. Okay, so who should be the next? Uh... So that would be uh, Mohammed Imran Qureshi. All right, so let's go to uh, Mohammed Imran Qureshi and let's bring you up as well into the, uh, uh, the panel. So that will take a few seconds before you actually uh, show up in the... Um, in the panel and you should be able to, uh, or I'll unmute you as soon as we uh, we see you. Yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, okay. So your sound should be, um, should be on. Are you able to hear us and can you speak to us? Okay, so at least I'm not able to hear Mohammed Imran Qureshi. You are again unmuted, so maybe the same problem as Dr. Halid. Uh, let's try one more time. Yeah. So this is part and parcel of this new medium. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and we, I know we were, we've been able to hear you in previous events, uh, Mohammed Imran Qureshi, as well as Dr. Halid Abu Bakr. So, uh, so in this, in this case, uh, and I'm really sorry also that it doesn't work, but it doesn't seem to be working technically, but uh, Dr. Qureshi asked, there are some real bottlenecks in immunization and proper de denominator determination is one of these. Uh, what is the best source of the denominator determination? So I think we talked a little bit about that, but Mamadou, do you want to repeat or kind of summarize a bit what the best sources are? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the source, um, we have source at national level, that, so we need to look at the census data and the projections to first to make sure that um, to compare to what we have from the program to make sure that there is discrepancies and uh, uh, discrepancies to take, in care, to, to take care of. So we need to do that diagnostic first um, to make sure that it's not just the numerator, but it's also the denominator. Um, and so at that point, um, one thing we can look at, we can do then is the a triangulation of the data to try to understand if it's a local situation, what kind of uh, um, specific situations are going on, try to understand from the community uh, what's going on. Uh, uh, to reach, to make sure that we are not uh, we are not missing uh, any 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 uh, any communities or any childrens. So we went through the presentation, some specific uh, um, some specific ways of looking at that, and some specific triangulations with ideas with CRVS system and all that. So I think I will refer to those slides. Uh, Thank you. Um, so Reda, I don't know if you want to, uh, I think we have some time. Um, there's also a question that didn't have as many votes uh, or a, a contribution, but I think I've been reading in the q and I think it's uh, a very, it seems to be a kind of an innovative thing. So Dr. Aji actually thinks, uh, asked what we think about the concept of zero target, which is something that they, I think, are using in uh, different states, I think in Nigeria. Um, so zero targets um, do not blind health workers with targets. So I think I would like to hear from that as well. Um, is, it, is it possible to ask Dr. Aji to join the panel? Yes, so Dr. Aji is now in the panel. Let's see how his microphone is working today. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear, doctor. Please go ahead. Okay, so basically, um, I wanted to understand the um, what the panelists feel about the zero target. So, like we've been saying, uh, I think this probably falls into 
the fifth idea to improve, which we are doing in the country, um, developing local solutions, because we discovered in two of the states where I had worked that um, because the urban populations uh, seem to um, grow rapidly, and like uh, some of my colleagues had said, the last census in Nigeria was in 2006, so we're talking 12 years, which is even more than the 10 years benchmark that Mamadou mentioned. Uh, we don't really have realistic estimates. So most of these um, 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 districts uh, will always say that they have, there's this complacency that they finish their work. However, when we do coverage surveys and LQS, uh, we discover that children are being missed. So what we decided to do now is to just work on zero targets. So at the field level, um, there are no targets uh, for, for, for the health workers to work with. Uh, they are linked to the, to the community resources. Uh, we track the newborns, and then we ensure that um, there's closer supervision to ensure that as the uh, cohorts arrive at the facilities, they are being vaccinated. And so we now use this information uh, kind of uh, to, to, to suggest what the actual populations can be. And the results have clearly shown to even the managers at the higher levels that even in districts and states where they had claimed that um, uh, they had immunized everybody, that a lot of children are still not being vaccinated. So. I just wanted to understand what, what, what do you feel about that? Because this is what we do to try and bridge this gap and vaccinate as many children as we can, right? Thank you, Dr. Raji, that's very interesting. So maybe first, uh, Mamadou or uh, Marta, do you have any feelings or feedback on that, Ivy? So I, I think uh, it's Marta here that at the local level, especially if this is really causes problems, then this is a good, good, good uh, way to take away that responsibility from the ground workers and just make sure that they do the best they can. And then at higher level, some kind of a data triangulation from these different sources can happen uh, periodically just to in some ways monitor that there are some progress made or not. But at the local level, I think that's a very nice innovative area and takes away some of the pressure. Uh, Mamadou, do you have additional comments? Yeah, I, I just think it looks natural to me. I think it's for the, the people who are going out to, to uh, vaccinate or to reach out these populations. Um, I think it's natural if we don't give them the target in a way, because what we are trying to do there is you have this period of time, reach out the maximum you can. For me, that looks like, seem to be a, a natural objective. So I think this is a good idea. Now, at some level, we need to make sure that we are vaccinating everybody or that we are in line with whatever we think our population is. So that does not prevent us from getting a population estimate at some level of aggregation and checking oh, it's local to that. But at the local level, I think this is, uh, I like the idea. I think it's, it's, for me, it looks natural. Also to chime in, I think every, uh, as, I think that's, Dr. Raji, that's as exactly as you said, kind of local solutions in the local context, right? Um, and I think in the context of Nigeria, where you have actually a lot of documented over-reporting, uh, also kind of frankly, relatively low coverage in general. So this might be the, the best place to start, really start on the basics, try to immunize as many people as possible. Um, as the system evolves and really becomes much more uh, sophisticated and, and well-functioning, you might need to revisit that. And, and again, think about targets to challenge people. But I think in your situation, this would be totally uh, acceptable and a, and a good idea. Uh, Reda, I think that I see in the panel now that uh, Dr. Khalid now is uh, twice Connected twice, yeah. All right, let's uh, unmute one of his microphones at a time. Uh, Dr. Halid, are you able to speak to us now? Okay, not from this microphone. Let me try the other connection. Yeah. That we have. Okay, here we go. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, but you need to uh, cut the, the sound on one of your connections. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Let me... 
Okay. 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 I'm I'm Dr. Khalid from Nigeria. I'm working with the WHO, and I'm also a scholar accompanist. I'm working at the subnational region in the EPI unit. So I just posted uh, my concern regarding the experience from Phil, where we know that Nigeria already being discussed, we have issues with targets more than expected, more than 100 due to denominator issue. And then in the field, when we go for supervision, we find out that the providers were falsifying data. And then we took measures to ensure that we find out the root cause. And we realized that when you go to facility, you do your survey, the data is being classified on the registers. Just if you the proxy indicators that they were targeting to reach monthly. So rather to that, we just try our best to see how we can be able to curtail that. At the state I'm working with, though we are, we are opportune to have MOU where we have funds to run activities or immunization. Basically, we took measures and then we did a GIS um, mapping just to find out the target population. And then we realized that more than 70% of the target we were using were actually not existing. And what we did was that we had the GIS estimate and then we went to the community and consulted with the community leaders to find out that if the target that was estimated is realistic and, and then we discuss with them and we come up with the target. Then after that, we come up with our own plan where we are giving targets to each facility based on that target. Some of the issues were that we can't get a realistic target due to the old census we were using, which was 2006 for Nigeria. And then we now feel that since the community leaders were into the polio structure as part of the legacy, we engage them on how to get the realistic target for place within the catchment area. And the community leader will list all the children within his catchment area. All the community leaders were engaged now in the state to ensure that they give us update of the people. Since they are together with those in the community, they know the realistic target compared to what we are estimating and then what the provider can give. So now we are doing reconciliation. The provider, will, when you go in for session, will reconcile with the community leader and find out what, how many number of children were being uh, he registered in his register, and then he updated those children, and then he immunized the children. Then after that, they, he can give them feedback on the uh, defaulters and then the performance of their catchment area. Despite the fact that we know that data falsification is an attitude, and you know changing attitude is very difficult, we put at least a very good uh, accountability framework where we first of all declare amnesty for the uh, data falsification, and then we focus on giving real-time feedback based on in line with the national emergency or a team organization where we have the NERIC, the CERIC, and the DERIC at the LGA level. So as to have focus on how the data are being uh, reported to the LGA for we validate the data before we put into the platform. So these are some of the experience. And then we realized that the home-based records from the uh, mix and mix survey is showing that uh, the target we were sending as Nigerian target, like our Penta 3 showing more than 100, but the mix and mix is showing 43%. We show a very wide gap. And definitely, we employ use of RILKs. We are now on quarterly basis. The, from national level, uh, the settlement were just selected to come and do LQS, and then the feedback is given to the LGS. So now definitely we have taken a lot of measures, and then we were hoping that since we started uh, beginning of this year, we are going to see how the performance is compared to the performance in the previous years. So these are some of the uh, feedback I have and then the experience from the field. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid, um, for sharing that. Just to summarize a bit, because the parts of the of your uh, um, presentations were kind of not very audible, but I'm going to summarize for everybody based on what I understood. 
So uh, you say, yes, it is a major issue. You also kind of uh, highlight for us again that the denominator and the numerator is not entirely independent in your country because like uh, what happens is that if you set these high targets, people will uh, provide information that uh, try to please those targets. So basically over report to kind of reach the targets. Uh, you have found evidence of falsification by sampling home-based records and look at the registers and you found even that the registers are uh, being falsified, which is of course something that we don't see often, but that also happens. Um, and then you uh, mentioned the same thing as the previous presenter also said, the, the concept of the zero targets, I think, uh, no targets for health workers so that they just need to vaccinate everybody and say what they really do. Um, you said that there's another level of accountability through the LQA, so the, the lot quality assurance methodology. Uh, just to explain that this kind of uh, uh, something that comes from polio, which is kind of a rapid uh, survey that goes to places and tries to find uh, if we can um, accept or reject 80% uh, coverage or not based on a, a small based uh, level service. And then you kind of uh, have a number of uh, other interesting ideas that I think in total add up to accountability uh, beyond, um, beyond targets. Uh, I think this was very interesting um, and, and I think it, it shows really the, a lot of the work that is going on in Nigeria. Just asking the co-panelists if, if anybody else wants to provide uh, feedback on that or uh, any ideas about that. So Mamadou or Marta, if you have any, anything to add. No, for me, I think it was well explained. Thank you okay. for sharing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abubakar. Um, I think we have a little bit more time, so we have a few more questions. I, I would propose to start with the next two. So Mohamed Bello uh, asks what the best ways to estimate population in an insecure area. Uh, and then Nicolas Velarde Gonzalez asks about uh, dominators for the local level, whether population is the only criteria to be considered or is there other things? Alain Blaise also asks uh, what our thoughts are about integrated target population in the whole health system as a solution to improve EPI targeted uh, population issues. So should we try to still take uh, those three? Yes, so would you like to bring them on as panelists or would you like to simply answer their questions as, uh, from, the, the, from the panel? Maybe we can start with that and if people then want to add to that, uh, they can raise their hand and say, okay, actually, let's start with that. So the best way to estimate population in an insecure area, um, it's of course quite hard if there's no access. Um, what can be done is often we, and, and I think you know that big, they're, they're often kind of polio goes where we not, not always go. So kind of it could be based on polio SIA estimates often. Uh, GIS is also a way to kind of look at what's happening in areas that you can't really um, go to. So the satellite imagery, for example, uh, and there might be other um, ways to think about it, but I don't know, uh, Mamadou or Marta, do you want to uh, think about that or kind of uh, to add uh, that insecurity insecurity it take many di dimensions for example some insecurity is around uh, gang for example in south america or some of and in those situations reaching out to the community sometimes may resolve the problem in a sense that if you talk with the community the gang members or etc and they can allow you to reach the community. So not all insecurities are the same. So we we can have other situations. Uh, also, one thing is in some of these displaced population, there are organizations that are well placed into working with these situations, uh, UN or NGOs uh, or UN agencies that are working with this uh, population. So reaching out to those to those agencies, NGOs, and collaborate with them for the vaccination, that also will help reach more easily these communities and and also report the data back. Because sometimes you can see in this camp that people are vaccinated, but the main system may not necessarily know that uh, these vaccinations, or it's not necessarily reported as part of the main uh, uh, health information system. Okay. Yeah, I think I would add to that and that's a good point. Uh, not all insecurity is the same insecurity. So there might be insecure areas where immunization teams are still welcomed. Uh, that's a very different situation than those where you're not welcomed. So 
Uh, what I would also su say is like, if you're going to do an intervention, like for example, a targeted intervention, like in Nigeria, where you actually have to intrude in um, hostile territory where you're actually not welcome, I would say do it for more than one intervention, just not, don't do just polio drops, uh, not just vaccination, but try to uh, serve those uh, children and people with a full set of interventions uh, one, once you make that effort. I know that in Nigeria, for example, there is even army escorts, uh, for example, to the Lake Chad Islands. Uh, if, you, if you do that, uh, I would say like try to uh, take, make the best of that opportunity. Um, so Nicolas asks whether we can set targets for the local level, dom denominators for the local level and whether population estimation is the only criteria to be considered. Um, maybe we can ask Nicolas to explain that question, uh, Reda. All right, let's find Nicholas in the, um, yeah. Uh, and then let's bring him up as a panelist. So we'll take a few seconds to uh, transfer over to the panel and then we should be seeing him. So in the meantime, I might maybe uh, try to explain or come back to Anna's question, which is what our thoughts are about integrated target population in the whole health system as a solution to improve API targeted population issues. So I think our position is that yes, uh, population as well as maps and ge geography are very much shared with the health system. So we would say like any kind of um, effort to improve targets should benefit the entire system and we should not use different targets than other programs. So I think, yes, this is definite, definitely an area that requires a lot of collaboration with the National Bureau of Statistics as well as HMIS and other programs. So totally um, uh, would say that we would favor the, the integrated approach there. So Nicolas Velarde Gonzalez, uh, welcome. Uh, you let me, uh, you should be unmuted. So we should be able to hear you. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. So you had a question about setting denominators for the local level. Could you tell us, uh, remind us where you're connecting from, what you do? and then give us the, the, the question and the context for that question. Okay, thank you. I'm, um, I'm talking from uh, Lima, Peru, but I've been working in Angola for the last 15 years. Uh, my point and my concern is about uh, um, targets at the local level. I think that was very well explained here in Peru that one thing is to monitor coverage, but uh, in terms of local level, we are more uh, monitoring uh, uh, targets and commitments uh, and challenge for the uh, for the small health facilities. My my concern is because uh, when you have to work for at the provincial and district level, and you need to face a request of technical assistance, uh, setting the denominator is usually or a target is usually a, a challenge. So uh, my point is, uh, in a, it is usually mentioned that a population is a common uh, a source of denominators and there is some concern when you try to come with a different approach. Um, I also see that this is hard because it is not mentioned in the national guidelines. So I just wanted to know in terms of your experience, what other approaches uh, can be uh, uh, utilized and as well, if uh, we can set target, different target for different vaccines, because this is not a common for people who has been working at a public service uh, for many years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. So first to say that I, I think I agree with what, what you're implying. I think um, often these denominators come top down and it seems like there's nothing to be done uh, about it. So then setting that, that incentive really creates a situation where people are forced to falsify, etc. So we need to, to kind of see if we can change that culture. Um, so what, what else can be done at the local level? I think so, yes, local enumerations can help um, if, if feasible and, and plausible. You can also kind of try to start looking more at numerators than at denominators. So not looking necessarily at, at coverage because like at that local level in the health facility, often coverage doesn't really mean very much, especially if it's over 100%, uh, but people might have a good idea about how many uh, people live in their village or how many children need to be vaccinated. And then thinking about numerators and comparing numerator trends might be more empowering or more sensible for people to do. Um, but so I, I, I hear your question. I, I don't know if I have a definite, definite answer on how to change that uh, culture of um, the higher levels uh, 
uh, imposing targets and then requesting or demanding uh, high coverage. Um, Mamadou or Marta, do you want to add something to that or somebody else from the panel? So that's where sometimes uh, really data triangulation and working together also with uh, demographers can help because with, with some of the unplausible uh, issues with the data, what these post denominators are, are, are suggesting and what the real data shows, one can argue that the, 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 the suggested data is, really doesn't make sense. Of course, as it was already mentioned, often this becomes very political. So we heard in some areas they are using different operational targets and then different targets which are for just the statistical and reporting purposes. So one of the practices to just make sure that operational targets are used for, for activities and for, uh, for setting targets. Uh, and I think what, what we saw from all these examples and all these innovative solutions that you also shared with us, that unfortunately it's not a one model that fits all. We have not really been able to provide you with a concrete solutions because the local knowledge and understanding the local setting is very, very important. And that's really is a very big part of how to choose what is the best possible uh, available data target or denominator at your local level. Just to add one small thing, I think one thing that I think is really missing in the system currently and that will be very helpful is if we can find a way to um, the local knowledge to be easily accessible at the um, centralized yeah. level, I think that will help a lot. When the centralized level come with the target, often we know that for some local reasons, those targets are off. But from the, from the national level, there is no systematic way of obtaining that information. So if we can find in the health information system a way that that local knowledge is easily uh, transferred to the national level, I think that will help a lot establish that dialogue between the national uh, targets, interests, et cetera, and the local knowledge so that that dialogue can be done very uh, more uh, smoothly. Uh, over. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mamadou and Marta, and also thank you all for all the panelists who actually uh, presented their uh, experiences or asked questions and, and shared with us. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, so thank you for that, and, and I think it really works well to have like more time for uh, for participant feedback. I just we only have two minutes left, so I just want to have like some kind of uh, quick wrap up, just to say that this presentation and the recording, uh, as well as kind of all these uh, background documents that you see there right now on your screen will be available in tinyurl.com slash IMAs hyphen resources. So the same folder as always. Um, and we will also kind of download the presentation that we just gave uh, in the same folder in just a few uh, minutes. Um, with that being said, I would also like uh, your uh, feedback on uh, how did we do? So uh, we would like to know as always if, um, this content was relevant for your work, if it helped you understanding the issues and if it enabled you to do something uh, different in your job. So if you can just go to, again to menti.com and help us um, uh, evaluate how well we did with this uh, webinar. Um, and then before we, uh, I'll, I'll let this uh, on the screen for a while. And as we do that, maybe also kind of remind you that we do these webinars on a weekly basis. This was already the fourth webinar um, there will be two more. So the next one will be uh, next week, same time, same place. And it will be around health management information systems, uh, integration, the challenges, the benefits with that. Uh, so we hope again to make it engaging. We have some uh, good uh, speakers and we'll also like to hear from you about your experiences with that. Um, to say also, because I saw that there's quite a few uh, French speaking uh, people in this webinar as well. We do repeat actually the same webinar as uh, these webinars. We repeat them also on a weekly ba basis, but 10 days after this one. So uh, this exact same webinar, it's not the exact same because we'll do it again, 
will be uh, delivered in French uh, on Monday. Uh, not next Monday, but the Monday after that. I think it's the 26th. Uh, and that will be on Monday at 3 p.m. Geneva time. So you can also sign up for that if you're a Francophone. Um, so with that, I think, um, Mamadou or Marta, do you have uh, final words for the participants? And if not, we can close. Just to thank you for all the very uh, good interventions from the participants. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think uh, you always learn because it's a difficult subject. So thank you for your contribution and uh, uh, looking forward to, to your comments. Yeah, also, also from my point of view, I think we learn uh, at least as much from you as you learn from us. So all your inputs and feedbacks are helpful and we'll try to incorporate that into uh, uh, guidance and, and kind of documents we're working on. So thank you very much. And I think uh, that um, concludes this webinar. Reda, do you want to close it? Or? Wraps it up. Yeah, there's a great comments in the in the chat from participants uh, thanking the panelists, uh, the course team, uh, for those of you who are scholars in the IMA Level One course. Uh, thank you, great team. Uh, so, Korka, the resources have just been shared. Jan just covered that in a slide, and I've given the URL, the link in the uh, chat. So, uh, very good and professional panelists. That's from Alain Blaise Tatsinku, from Nicholas. Thanks for the webinar. It was enlightening. Um, waiting for more videos from Marta and Mamadou. So that may have been uh, someone who's seen uh, Mamadou's and Marta's video in the IMA course. Uh, thank you uh, to the team. Appreciate your efforts. Uh, overall, a lot of um, a lot of gratitude. Obviously, I want to acknowledge all of the WHO scholars and especially the accompanists, but also all of the participants that could not be included in the very first cohort of the Level One course and. This is the webinars are open events. I'd like to challenge you to, for the next one, for each of you to actually invite one, just one of your colleagues to attend in addition to yourself. So next Wednesday, we'd like you to come back and this time bring a colleague. So send them the invitation link and just uh, make sure that they show up. This should double num the number of participants, logically. So if you'd like to, if you're ready to help us double the number of the participants for the next webinar, uh, please type yes into the chat window and that will end. This is how we will uh, end the webinar. Okay, I see, I only see six people. Okay, nine, 10. Okay, and you don't have to do this, but if you'd like to, if you feel this was worth attending for yourself and would like to share a colleague, just type yes into the chat window to let us know this has been worthwhile for you. All right, and I'm just gonna give the uh, the URL in case, yes, uh, to actually uh, attend. So, yeah. All right, thank you very much and wishing you a good week and see you next Wednesday. Um, we're hoping to see all of you next uh, next Wednesday, along with at least one of your colleagues. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.